Right, Chris. Before, yeah, before we look at the microscope, uh, someone had asked about the spider web book. Um, uh, this is it. Don't know if you can see that. It's quite a big book. It's really cool. Covers spider webs and what they do and stuff. Um, <clears throat> I can put a link. I can dig a link out to where to buy that if you are wanting it. Um, if in terms of there is the webs are mentioned in the um, field guide in a useful way. Um, the that Craig men showed earlier, and there's also um, an old. Um, Field Studies Council book on how to identify spiders to family level that does have a good section on webs as well. I, I'm, I imagine that's still available. Cool, right. I'm going to try and share my microscope with you. And there are some technical glitches with that last time. I'm hoping that won't be an issue this time. Let's see what happens. Um, I found a new way to share things. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And hopefully this will work. Can you see? Uh, can you see a spider on one side, and yes, a book on another? Yeah, we've got the microscope on the left and the text on the right, Chris. Yes, cool. Let's hope this works. And I've got spare batteries in case the camera runs out too. So, um, so yeah, I just thought uh, normally when I run a course. Um, we would go back to the lab and identify things. And I've got a couple of um, different um, sp species of spider that I usually give people first to go through because they, they, show, they show different ways of identifying things, really, and the differences that you can sometimes encounter with spiders. Um, so they're both female, just because it's a bit easier for people starting out. Um, but I do have males of both the species as well that we can look at. Um, and last time I ran this course, I think going through these two species really took up the whole of the time. Um, I do have others. Um, is, I've got many spiders, as you might imagine. Um, I do have others that we could potentially look at if we had time. And if we were doing a proper course, we would have a whole day and you'd be looking at all sorts of spiders. Um, so maybe when, again, when the viral apocalypse is cancelled, there'll be normal courses again and you can come and look at spiders with me. But let's start. Let's have a look at this one first here online. So this is a spider. It has, the, the spider has been dead for 10 years, by the way. It's doing pretty well. And it's been, it's helped so many people learn how to identify spiders, like many hundreds of people. Um, it's got two body parts, the cephalothorax and the abdomen. It's got eight legs. I think this one actually probably does have eight legs. They don't always. And two palps. And it's got, you can't see them very well here, but we will look at them later. Eight eyes and it's chelicerae. And um, the book that I have up here is um, is Mike Roberts um, Collins Field Guide. So that that is really the book I would recommend as a starting point if you want to identify spiders to species. And I've taken us to the the key, which is a way of identifying things. So to begin with, the key asks um, if it's really the first the first question is asking if the end of the palp the tarsus so the palp being oh i can actually use my cursor in this can't i can you see my cursor yeah we can chris can i just interrupt for a moment is it possible to adjust the focus on the microscope um I, unfortunately when it's unfortunately when it's zoomed out to that extent it doesn't focus very well um but once we zoom in it will focus very nicely oh, okay um, that's great yeah we um, can see your cursor yeah, cool. I mean, like when I do this, it will we will be able to focus better. Okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. See, there we go. So it does work. It's just I, when it's zoomed out all the way for some reason, the the camera and the microscope have disagreements. Um, so these are the palps, and that's the end of the palp, the tarsus. Um, and it's asking, is it modified or swollen in any way? And in this case, it isn't. Um, so that means we go to question two. Underside of ab abdomen with epigyne, so that's the the female genitals with hardened structures. Um, let's have a look. There we go. So 
the answer to that question is yes. So th this is the epigyne here. It looks a bit like a stamp. Um, and that this is hardened. Um, now, it can be hardened to a greater or lesser extent, depending on the, the type of spider. But this one's got good structures that are clear to see. So adult female we have, super. We know what we're doing. We can identify this to species. And some pictures of that. Now we need to ask ourselves some other questions. So we go to the main key now. So this first question is asking about those chelicerae and how they are. It's going to tell us if we have a tarantula or not. Um, so here are the chelicerae from the underside. So they're, as we've said in spiders, they're adapted into fangs. And as you can see, they pinch inwards. So we don't have a tarantula today. We have an orthognath or libidognath, sorry. Um, we have a libidognath spider with pinches, pinchy um, fangs. The next question um, that we go to asks if it has a crabellum. Now the crabellum, is a special structure for making fluffy silk like um, lace weavers do. Um, and if it had a crabellum, it would be about here and it would look like a sausage. There is nothing like a sausage here, so it does not have a crabellum. And I know it's one of these things you say, but they, it really is an obvious feature when you have it. Um, sometimes some features are not so obvious, but cr the crabellum is. Um, and it also have these other um, structures on its legs for spinning out that fluffy silk, um, but they're harder to see than the cribellum itself. Um, so we do not have a cribblet spider, so we go to question seven. Now I have to say, I've I this key didn't exist when I learned how to identify spiders, um, so I only started going through the key myself when I started doing these online courses. So it's really been an interesting experience for me. Um, so question seven, spider with six eyes um, or spider with eight eyes are the take home things there. You, you do get weird things happening with spiders. They can sometimes uh, have strange eye arrangements, but with weird mutations or deformities, but, um, but not, so, not all the time. Anyway, so we have some eyes there. It's actually not too unclear. So obviously spider eyes can be in all sorts of places. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight eyes. So we have an eight-eyed spider, which means we go to question nine. And Question nine is a bit, it's a question in the key that people in my experience often trip up on because this is, it gives you lots of different options basically of the, of different spider families. Um, and it, so we get nine A option there, nine B here, nine C, nine D. And often people stop at this page, but it continues and there are many, many more options. Um, and it's about looking at the spider and here and again you'll see I identify spider I think it looks like this spider um, I know it looks like this spider it has the eye arrangement as you can see in the book with four on top and then four along the face the clipius here um, so it is a wolf spider like Hosodei so to identify, we know the family. Now we need to find out what genus and then hopefully which species we've got. And so we go to another part of the book for that. We go to the Lycosidae, page 209. So let's see if we can get there. Probably could have just typed that in, I guess. Let's do that. Let's try to 
there we go. So, Lycosidae. Oh, they're so cool, by the way. They carry their babies on their backs and look after them. They're awesome. So, at each um, family section, you get a new, another key, which is the key to the genre of, um, of the spiders within the family. So, in this case, what is it saying? It says, patella of palps, white in both sexes. Now, these are the these are the palps, and there's certainly nothing white about them. So, not white. Go to question two. Height of the clippius, that's the face, that's the gap between the mouth and the eyes, at least twice the diameter of an anterior eye. Let's, let's have a look if we can see that well. Right. I know it's not entirely in focus, be a bit tricky for me to achieve that right now with all the things I have to hold, but um, hopefully you can see that it has quite a big clippeus, quite a big mouth compared to the other picture. But something I find quite useful with this is the how steep the sides of the, the head are um, or not, because as you can see, the options are quite distinct in that way too, and it's got quite steep sided um, sides. So we go to question three. Um, so head viewed for in the front as we were viewing it a second ago with almost vertical sides. And then there's other features you can look at as well, but that is the clearest one. Our head viewed from the front with sloping sides. Um, I, I think this spider has very steep sided um, head. Um, so this is a pardosa, that's the genus. And then it takes us to page 213. And when we get here, um, we get a description about the genus, and then it goes into different species. And in the species descriptions, um, it, there are diagrams of the genitals of male and female included. So here we have a diagram of the epigyne, and here a diagram of the palp. Um, the diagrams of the palps may be from different angles, depending on the features that are key for identifying them. So really, this is a case of looking through the book until we can find an epigyne that looks like our one, or her one. Obviously, I don't have an epigyne. Um, and none of you do either. So there we go. I think that's relatively in focus. Um, here we have the epigyne. And it has various structures. And so we go through until we find one that looks like ours. And this is where making a drawing can be very helpful. Um, at least I find that helpful. You can get photographs of epigynes on these websites. That European spider website I mentioned does have photographs of many species as well. I would caution against Googling because there's quite a lot of misidentified spiders on the internet. Anyway, we go through till we find something that looks like that. For me, a key feature here is this kind of we saddly shape, and it goes up to a sort of squarey bit. <laughs> so I don't think any of these look like that. Ah, there we go. So Bob's your uncle. This epigyne looks like this epigyne. So I would say this is Pardosa amentata, um, which is a very common wolf spider, um, probably in your garden and certainly in mine. Um, and there's another common wolf spider as well that is also in my garden and probably in yours, which is Pardosa pulata. And it looks very different. This is Pardosa pulata's epigyne. So you can see it's very different. I, I, to me, it's like two bits rather than this, um, two bits on either side rather than the sort of stamp shaped single unit here. Um, so that is how you identify a spider, um, at least if you've got a girl. I can show you a male of the same species um, here. 
as well. So the difference with identifying the male is at the start, you would have that first question about the sex and maturity of the spider and where it says um, swollen or modified tarsus on palp, you'd be yes, because it would be swollen and modified. Um, and you would know you've got a male. Um, basically, male spiders wear boxing gloves, but they're very delicate, I guess, because they use them for mating. This should be the right one. Yeah. So. This is also an old spider. And he has certainly seen better days. He is also 10 years dead. So the key difference here with the male, I mean, they do look quite different anyway. Males tend to be slimmer. But they've got these swollen palps, which are the secondary sexual organs. Which one is that? Not good. He's being really good and showing us exactly what we need to see, which is very unusual when you put a spider into alcohol. I could claim it's just because I've got super mad spider skills, but that wouldn't be the truth. Um, I, I, honestly, if I'm doing uh, identifying spiders um, and I'm doing hundreds of them, um, I very often just pinch the palps off the spider um, and they're much easier to manipulate that way. Um, obviously, I put them back in a tube together when I'm done. Um, so I realize it's mirrored effectively, but um, here's the palp and we're looking at the features. So this is Pardosa amentata. It's got this curved, this particular curved and straighty bit on this embolus. Um, you can see different species have different shapes here. So for wolf spiders, or for particularly Pardosa, these protrusions are really key to identifying them. And they do look different if you turn them. So as you look from below as well, they can be very different. Um, and that can be a helpful way of um, looking at it if you're not 100% sure from looking at the side. Um, but anyway, yeah, so this is Pardosa pulata, which is that other common species which looks very similar um, and will be living alongside this one in most situations. And as you can see, it's got this uh, sort of curved, pointy, um, thin structure there. And our Pardosa amentata has got a more robust structure that um, has a wee pointy bit and curves actually the other direction, um, which we have here. So that's a quick run through the key for, with uh, with one spider. Um, I think probably the best thing to do is to run through the other spider that I use on courses and then take questions. Um, I think just because of the number of people on this, which is amazing again, by the way, um, it will be easier for us to do it that way. Um, so give me a second while I find my other spider. Okie dokie, this one seems in good nick. So this spider is also 10 years dead and been teaching many people. Um, I, I said I didn't go out and kill these spiders to teach people about spiders. I don't, um, I don't kill spiders unless it's part of a, a study that's going to benefit their conservation. Um, I, but other, you know, we all have different views on killing things. Um, it's certainly killing a few spiders makes no difference whatsoever to their populations, but it sucks for that individual spider. So we'll go back to the start, I guess. I can't remember which page the key starts on. Should have had a look at that. Oh. I mean, you're getting a good preview of this book, which I would, again, strongly recommend that you go and buy if you want to look at spiders. Ah, why can't 
can't find it. Give me a second, I'm going to look at my real book and see what page it's on. So if we go back to the first question again to have a look at sex and maturity of our spider, um, does it have modified palps? I would say not. Um, here we are. Tarsus is not modified. Does it have an epigyne? Mm -hmm. I would say it does. So this is the epigyne of this spider. You can see it's fairly different than our other spider. Let's have a look at its chelicerae, its myth parts, its fangs. I think it's pretty clear on this one that they pinch inwards, so it is not a tarantula. It is, in fact, Lepidognatha, Araniomorphae. So we've got a question two. Does it have a crebellum? So again, crebellum is a sausage-shaped type thing, and it would be on here. And no, it does not have a crebellum. So it's not a cripple at a spider. We got a question seven. How many eyes does our spider have? on her back there, which is actually quite unusual for a spider too. Um, she's behaving very well. How many eyes does she have? She has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can see the eyes on the end are very close together, so the pigmentation, that black pigmentation, bleeds into each other, but there are definitely two eyes in each of those patches. So we have an eight-eyed spider. So we've got a question nine. And if we remember, question nine is our gigantic question um, with lots of different um, spiders to look at. And yep, there's doesn't really look like that, doesn't 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 look like that. Doesn't look like that. No, it doesn't look like that. And this is a really key thing at the bottom of the page is spider not fitting descriptions 9A to 9L. And people often miss that bit. So it doesn't actually have to look like any of those spiders. And in our case, it doesn't. So we go to question 10. This is really asking us, are the eyes black with um, with white around the outside, or are they white with black around the outside? And I think in our case, it's pretty clear that ours are white with black around the outside. So we go to question 12. Now this one's a bit tricky. Um, so. Do, it, so do the tarsi on its legs, the ends of its legs, basically, its feet, do they have three claws? Um, or do they just have two? Let's have a look. This might be hard to see with the online microscope set up. Mm, not a good angle. It'd be nice if we could find a leg that we could don't have to manipulate too much. Mm. 
Yeah, there we go. So, hopefully, it's a bit tricky to see, um, it, but it, you would certainly see it in real life. Um, but if we look at the shape, we've got the claw here, and there is another claw next to it that's pointing there. So it's got two claws there, and then it's got this third claw that comes out and points in a down, down like spiky way. So we have this scenario here. Um, so we go with question 15. And it's slightly strange that 15 is here and 13 is there. Um, that follows it, but anyway, question 15. And this is a really tricky one. Um, so it's asking whether or not the um, the foot, the last section of its back leg, the fourth leg, um, has a comb of serrated bristles. So that's hairs that have wee bifurcations or whatever you call them coming off of them. Um, and this is really hard to see, and the key does actually recognize that this is, uh, does say this is very hard to see even with high magnification. Um, we'll see what we can do. And this is one of the bigger species of this family in the UK as well. So you can see how tricky this can be. There we go. Sure. So, I don't think we can really. I doubt you will be able to see clearly the uh, whether or not it's got wee wobbly bits, um, but it does. Handily though, when they when they have this feature, the 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 hairs do look a bit thicker, which I think you can see here, um, and that that's that's handy. But it may be the case that if you're unsure, you follow the key in both directions and see where you end up. But in any, in, in any case, I'd say that that's um, got the weak home. So we go to question sixteen. Um, and we're looking at the labium. Is the labium swollen or not? That's part of the underside of the mouth. So it's just in here, and I would say it doesn't look like this. It doesn't have this shape, and so it's not sausage-like. Um, so um, I would say that this is a theridid, which is takes us to page two hundred and sixty. But before we go to page 260, I'd just like to show something. I'll just check what page number I want. Um, well, it's not going to work that way. Does this have the plate? Let's see. Ah, no. So, in the, if you were to flick through the colour plates, and I don't know if, uh, maybe if I stop sharing my screen for a moment and show you my book. Um, so, can you see me clearly again? Yep. Yep. Cool. So, I showed earlier, the book has these colour plates. Um, and I've already told you, don't look at, don't identify your spider based on the colours and patterns and that kind of thing. But they can sometimes help you narrow down to roughly what spider you've got. 
And if you were to flick through this book, like if I run university practicals, pretty much every student does instead of following the key, um, you get quite quite. You would, uh, if I can find it. Mm -hmm. There day. There we go. So basically, um, our spider looks like that. Now that's Enoplagnatha ovata pictured in the book, and it can be quite variable. Sometimes it's got pink stripes and stuff. Um, they, they're really beautiful spiders. They're called candy striped spiders, is their common name. Um, and there are two species which are very similar, so you can't identify it to species by flicking through to there but it certainly narrows it down. And there is one other spider that looks a bit similar, but there are differences in patterns. So if you were to go down that route, you would quickly learn you've got the wrong family and come back here. So there's something to be said for flicking through and looking at pictures sometimes, but always check, always go to the section of the book and check the genitals and all that kind of jazz. So I'm going to share my screen again and we'll get to the point of identifying this. Cool. So we want to go to page 260, wasn't it? Which is quite near here. So this is th the family Therididae. Um, what we have here is a relatively unusual looking Theridid. Most Theridids are small with really bulbous abdomens. And I used to confuse them with money spiders when I was a, a boy. Um, but in any case, this is a slightly unusual one. And it's one of the bigger ones. So we need to go to the key. If we want, well, we don't need to, we could actually flick through to Enoplognatha and have a look, but we will go through the key because why not? Um, so, does it, so it will have a colulus, which is a little bobbly bit near its spinnerets. I'm finding it a little bit tricky to look at just part of the book at the time. Um, benefit of having a real book is you can look at the whole thing. So anyway, let's get back to this. Now it's much easier for me now on my end. Um, so what does the colulus look like? Well, in contrast of bristles, it's not a bad, bad sized thing compared to its bristles. So I think that would take us to six. So just bear in mind that the, the although the pictures do show bigger size colulus and stuff, um, part of the key here is the proportion of the size compared to the bristles. And just, and just pay attention to that. It's not always the case that it might be giant or tiny. It's not always as clear cut. So Size of the adult less than two and a half millimeters. Well, um, I know I don't have anything to measure that with, but I don't know. Where's my finger? Um, it's definitely bigger than two and a half millimeters. So we go to number seven. Abdomen gray to black with no pattern or light spots, but usually with two or three pairs of reddish impressed spots. Abdomen with a pattern or markings of light, perhaps particular spots. It does have spots. So we go to number 10. Dorsal, a point light in color, maybe greenish white. That sounds like ours, and it's got a picture of an epilognatha next to it, and I'm saying this is an epilognatha anyway. Um, so that's what we have, so spider, Spider with an abdominal pattern or markings. Um, 
sternum pale yellow and narrow, black median line, black border, legs pale yellow, with extreme end of tibia. So it does, it meets all of these criteria. Um, so we go to Enoplugnatha, page 289. Right, and now we go to the point of looking at our at the genitals and stuff. I think this is quite a good case where you can see it's quite difficult to see the features because of how dark this is. Um, and how, how dark the markings are. But we will have a look anyway. I will do our best. So, it, I mean, it's obviously that shape. But there are, like I say, two species which are relatively, that will, they look very similar. Um, and their epigynes are key here. And this is the two. And as we, can, as we can see, even without seeing the features too clearly, there is this very defined difference, I would say, here, which is along kind of the epigastric fold of the spider, along here. And in Enoplugnatha latimana, it cuts in and rounds and out. And in Ovata, it more or less follows the line of the epigastric fold. And in this case, the, the epigyne, the end of the epigyne, edge of it, whatever you want to call it, is following the epigastric fold. And it's not cutting in like it would in latimana. So this, I would say, is Enoplugnatha ovata. A, a female. Now, I do have a male of this one as well that I can show you. Um, please give me a tick. So as you can see, it's actually quite a different shape from the female, this male. Um, it's a lot um, slimmer, for lack of a better word. It's more elongate. They do actually look a bit, so although these are theridids, they do look a bit like, um, in terms of overall shape, Enoplugnatha do look a bit like tetragnathids, which are orb weavers. Um, oh, there we go. with the long jaws and all. The jaws are getting in our way a bit there. I wonder if the other side will be better. So, let's see if we can get both of these on the same page, oh, or on the same screen at the same time. So these are the palps. Let's come out of focus, but I will get that back in a second. Um, now, again, a really key structure is this protrusion, it's embolus, um, and in Ovata, it's just this curl which bends like that down and in Latimana it has a couple of bends so that's really what we want to look at.
right? You can get glass beads, actually, which can be really useful for getting spiders into particular positions um, rather than holding them like I'm doing right now. Anyway, there we go. Hopefully you can see that protrusion there. And to me, it looks like it's just got that one sort of bend and pointing down at the end, like Ovata, rather than a couple of curls and pointing forwards in Latamana. So that is... Enopognatha ovata, a male. And again, the only difference in terms of keying that out is at the start, um, where it says, is the palp swollen or modified? You would say yes, and you'd know that it's a male. Um, and I mean, now that I've told you that male spiders have swollen and modified palps, it, you probably don't need to do that bit of the key. Um, I'm sure you will remember. And that's the two spiders I would generally start people off with in a, in a training course before looking at other things. Um, so I think this would be a good point for questions, um, really. I'll stop sharing my screen. There we go. OK, thanks for okay, that, Chris. Thanks. A real insight as, uh, as before. Very detailed. I'm just looking back through um, the questions to the, the conversation. Can can you see the conversation? Yeah, I've just opened it, but I think there's maybe been a wee bit that's been happening. <laughs> yeah. Je Jennifer, uh, right back at the beginning, um, uh, had commented and said, do you have a link to the spider family key that you were sharing? That that was actually from, which, which book was that from that you were sharing that, on your screen there? That is the Collins field guide so you need okay. to buy this book um i can't i can't give you the book <laughs> yeah yeah if we were running a training course in real life i would give i would give everyone a copy of one of my books to use for the course um but that would actually be impossible with hundreds of people anyway so <laughs> yeah of course uh rachel has shared a link to a website um an excellent website she said uh, rna rna.unib.ch can you see that link? Um, I cannot see the link, but I have a few pages up. Aranier. So that is. So yes. That, so that. Yeah, yeah. So that is the. Uh, I mean, I can share my screen again, and I've got a couple of pages up that are handy. Yeah, I mean, that that link um, is in a conversation yeah, for anybody. That, 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 and that link is in my presentation as well. So that's the Spiders of of Europe um, website. It is very useful. Um, let's see. Share. The screen. I will share my. Just do this again. So this is the, the website, um, and it is really useful. The thing that you need to remember when you're using this, though, is that it has all the spiders in Europe. It's not just the spiders in Britain, um, and so it is possible to make mistakes in a key and go off in directions and find and arrive at spiders that don't live here. So you just have to bear that in mind and be careful when you're using it. Another really useful resource is the World Spider Catalog. Um, so if you're if you are doing any kind of work with spiders um, that might be research or conservation, it should be possible to apply for an account with the World Spider Catalog, and it's the most amazing um, repository of information on identifying spiders. So um, they try to collect all of the literature that relates to identifying every species of spider in the world. Um, so it is a really super useful resource um, if you are eligible for an account. OK, thanks. Um, uh, Rosalind uh, commented at 11.43. I think it was when you were talking about an epigyne on the, the first uh, specimen. Do they actually use them for mating or are they just to attract a mate? Yep, that's a good question. Um, so the the male palp and the, and the female epigyne are like a lock and key system. So um, the male palp fits perf perfectly into the epigyne of a female of the same species and that's where the sperm gets deposited. There's been some research recently which suggests that they, that, that's not actually the genital opening of, of the spiders and that they have another genital opening that the sperm gets transferred to after. Um, 
uh, which is really interesting and cool. Um, but that, that was a relatively recent discovery. But yes, they're used for mating. So that that, that leads on to Dan's question. Following that, why, why are male why are male palps so complex in shape? Is it a lock and key situation? Totally. And the spiders I've shown you today do have quite complicated palps. Um, there are spiders that have quite simple palps as well, with maybe just a couple of features that you can see. Um, it just depends on the family of spider. OK. Uh, Joanna's commented, they, they transfer the sperm through the pedipalps into the female, but they can also use them for courtship. That's true. That's <laughs> Sometimes they have got um, hairs that are very noticeable, like white hairs and stuff, and, and spiders may do little dances or do tapping on on the web and things like that. Just scanning through uh, a number of positive comments. A few people had to leave early, but uh, plenty of people um, uh we're enjoying it and and particularly the detail um uh and ben's got to leave sorry with so <laughs> so many comments coming through it's difficult to uh there we go Dan daniel has asked um can you offer any tips tools or techniques for manipulating specimens into position under the microscope what do you use to hold things in position for iding or photography OK, so um, I've mentioned that you can get glass beads. I think they're for uh, chromatography or something. And I do have some of those which can be useful for ensuring a spider stays in a particular position. But honestly, I don't use them very often because I find them a bit of a faff um, and I go through a lot of spiders. Um, so what I most this is what I mostly use. I don't know if you can see those. Um, there are just a couple of different kinds of forceps. Um, this. This one, these ones are quite blunt and quite good for delicate manipulation. Um, these ones are quite sharp and good for fine manipulation. But you, and you, these are actually pretty good for dissecting spiders too. Like I can dissect a spider's epigyne with these without needing to use blades or anything um, after having been practicing it for a while. So that, that's what I use. You can use mounted needles as well. People use those. You can get forceps that are like bent, like little you know, little beaks um, that can be quite good for getting in to uh, funny angles at small things. There's lots of stuff you can do, whatever works for you. Uh, great. Pat Patrick has asked, what magnification were you using for the palps and the epigyne? What would that have been? Um, I think with the way that I've got the microscope set up right now, I think it could only go to um, times 60 at most. So at the most I'll have been at will have been times 60 today. OK. Uh, Car Carrie had to leave, but she said it was really interesting and great to hear from another non-academic spider nerd. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure how you'll take that. But, um, Very positively. <laughs> you meant it positively. Um, uh, Sim has asked, is, is there a pocket sized ID book you would recommend or an app maybe? Um, no. I well, mean, I guess that's that's the closest thing to pocket sized. I mean, honestly, the, the, yeah. And that book is excellent. The pictures are great. If you're just out and wanting a rough idea of what you've seen, then you can't do better than that book. Yeah, I mean, it's it's great for me. Um, and it, the, the the level of detail I can just about get my head around. Um, but it's, yeah, you need a big pocket to fit it in. <laughs> Maybe go in your rucksack or the top of your bag. <laughs> um, lots more thanks for an amazing talk, great talk. Um, plenty of positive feedback, Chris, which is great news. Um, Tom Spencer's put a comment in. Uh, in your Countryside article, you talk about the importance of experience. As an ecology graduate, I've been really struggling to gain relevant employment experience. The best I can see to get it would be in graduate consultancy positions, but those also require experience. So what is your best advice to someone trying to break past this Catch-22? Cheers for the ID tips. It's been very useful. It was true when I left university in 2004, 
as well. But the, the market is even more competitive now than it was back then, which is incredible. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, I would suggest um, finding a, vol a volunteer group um, that you can go out with. So maybe, um, I, well, there may be opportunities with bug life here and there. Um, go out um, with wildlife trust groups. See if you can. Uh, it depends what you want to get skills in. I mean, if you want to get skills for spiders, um, you're, that's probably not going to help your employment very much. Um, if you want to get skills like um, Great Crested Newt surveys and Great Crested Newt licenses and that kind of thing, then go and find your local amphibian and reptile group. Go onto the ARG UK website and there'll be lists there. If you want to do bird stuff, get involved with the relevant bird charity. Um, that's the best you can really do. And I, I, right now, I totally appreciate that it will be very difficult to get much experience just because of the restrictions at the moment. Um, but yeah, just find volunteer organizations, find an, or find an expert that maybe isn't associated with one and is willing to mentor you. Um, that's another possibility. I started, when I was younger, I just got in touch with people that if I found a name that was associated with something, I just tried got in touch with them. Back then, I was using a telephone. It was how the world has changed. <laughs> yeah, I, I would echo that as well, Chris. I, I, you can't overestimate the importance of volunteering, and particularly after you graduate and maybe finding it difficult to find employment. But I think many people who work in conservation in the conservation sector have to volunteer um, to some extent or another before they are able to step into employment, whatever kind of employment that is. But RSPB um, are a great source for um, welcoming volunteers. So Nature Scott, Scottish Wildlife Trust, as well as a variety of other smaller charities, um, Butterfly Conservation, um, Bug Life, British Dragonfly Society, there are a number of options um, to explore. And like like you said, Chris, it's just a matter of um, uh, looking for what interests you the most and seeing what's local. And, you know, obviously post-pandemic, when we're able to go out and volunteer in groups again. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, uh, Maggie has said sense of smell in spiders. I know nothing of this. Okay, so uh, spiders have lots of senses. Um, they're quite different from us. <laughs> um, so they, it, it, yes, they can smell, but not the way that we do. I, I, they can pick up pheromones and chemicals um, and things um, with various sensory organs. And in fact, the um, spiders, no matter whether or not they are web building spiders or not, always leave a trail of silk as a as a trip. Well, I guess I guess in case they fall, um, but they also leave pheromones on that silk, so other spiders of the same species can get information from them on that. So yeah, they smell. They also have several different ways of detecting changes in air pressure. They got at least at least two different organs for that, maybe more. Um, so although they can't, they don't have ears. They will be detecting sound um, very very well. Okay. Um, does, do any spiders externally fertilize? No, not that I'm aware of. Grand. Uh, another a comment from Mike saying it would be good to have similar microscope presentations on insects and the, on other insects, presumably, uh, well, on, on insects generally and I will pass that comment on to uh, to other presenters in the future, Mike. Um, uh, are there many non-native spider species currently found in the wild in the UK? Yeah, um, there are several. Um, so there's at least three in Scotland. Um, and it, it depends how far back you want to go and what you want to count as being native or not as well. Um, I mean, house spiders probably didn't start off here. Um, uh, but that's going back. I think where they've come from will be dependent on like trade hundreds of years ago. Um, there is a species of spider that's come into Scotland um, or has been found in Scotland relatively recently called um, Rugothoides sexpunctatus. I'm afraid I don't know what the common name is for that. There are common names for all these spiders. They were, um, I think a lot of them were made up um, by Natural England at some point, um, but they didn't exist when I learned them, I'm afraid. Um, and it's either from America or Russia, 
um, and it, it's found in very. It was mainly being found around Glasgow um, uh, in the past, uh, previously, but now it's turning up further afield, and it may just be a case that people haven't been looking at it. But also, spiders are good dispersers. But it's a really small theridid. It's not it doesn't seem to be causing any problems. We don't have any introdu introduced spiders that are big and dangerous. Great. Um, Sim has asked, what on-site magnifier do you use? So when I'm out in the field looking at spiders, I use um, a times 10 um, magnifying glass that I've had for decades. Um, and I actually, it was, it was sold as a, um, a geological magnifying glass, um, and it was cheaper than buying one from a natural history place, um, even though they're exactly the same things. <laughs> um, you can get really cool ones these days that have built-in lights and stuff, which really help you see features, though. My one's an old metal thing. Uh, another, uh, well, various comments saying thanks for a great talk and the opportunity to go through the key. Um, what is the benefit of storing spiders in alcohol instead of pinning them? If you pin a spider, it will shrivel up and not be any use to you in the future. I would kind of spin that round as well. Given I'm a Spider-Man by trade, um, I keep most things in alcohol. Why do people pin things? <laughs> spider nerds unite! <laughs> um, lo lots of uh, lots of thanks and comments about. An awesome talk, Chris. So that's good to good to see. Um, uh, there may be relevant online volunteering opportunities on on Zooniverse. I've not come across Zooniverse before. Is that uh, Maya's just shared that? I don't I don't know if that's a link or not. I, I'll, I'll I'll look that up. Um, Uh, Linda's commented. That's that's a nice comment to receive. I, I've watched this as a lifelong arachnophobe. Thanks for taking me part way beyond the fear. That's that's great to hear, Linda. Yeah, thank you for coming in that case as well. Absolutely. I mean, thank everyone coming, but particularly if you, if any of you are scared of spiders, really, thanks for coming. Steve Lucas has commented, and quite rightly, please do not go into caves, underground sites where bats are likely to be hi hibernating. Disturbing, disturbing bats is unlawful. And in general, I would also say don't go into caves and structures like anyway, because it's dangerous unless you're doing it with permission and with the appropriate safety stuff, regardless of any bats. Yeah. How does light pollution affect spiders, Maya has asked. I don't know. It'd be interesting to do a study on it. I mean, I guess it might affect what they do to an extent because um, spiders do seem to get attracted to lights and stuff. But I wonder, you know, they don't have very, they can detect changes in light, most of them, but not really see things. Maybe they'll, I mean, sometimes I guess they're making webs because it's a good place to get insects. Might be good for them. <laughs> Patrick has asked, looking at the illustrations of palps, there are several structures that seem to vary between species. Is there a go-to structure for ID, i.e. one that is most frequently used? Not really. It does depend on the family and genus of spider as to which features are most distinct. Um, so this is why I suggest it's worth drawing a picture and making particular, taking particular care to draw features you think look distinct. I know that's a difficult thing to do, but that's how I learned how to do these things. Um, often the sort of the embolus, the sort of protrusions, the pointy bits um, that stick out and forward, they're often um, particularly distinct, but that's not true in every case. Okay. Uh, Mark has asked, are there examples of copulatory plugs or structures left behind by males after mating? Yes, 
some spiders do seem to um, block the epigyne after mating, um, sometimes with waxy, um, a sort of waxy um, substance. So springing to mind immediately is I find that quite a lot with um, a type of jumping spider called Heliophanus cuprius, and it can often obscure the epigyne. So when you're looking at a spider, sometimes you need to keep in mind that the epigyne itself might be obscured by another structure. Um, Sue has um, mentioned the, the the book on the identification of spiderwebs. Sue, the, there was a link shared to that book earlier on in the conversation. You can scroll back through the conversation and find the, the link to that book. But I literally just Googled spiderwebs book and the first book that came up um, was the book that Chris had showed us. So it is obviously available through um, various retailers. Yeah, this, this one only, was... It, sorry, it's only just been published. So yeah, it's definitely right. available. Yeah, I mean, that, that link was through Amazon. So um, it, I mean, it's other, available on the internet if you search for it. Other booksellers are available. I find that Pemberley Books is fantastic for um, invertebrate publications. Great. Um, um, I has shared a link to Zooniverse. I'll, I'll check that out. That's a that's a new um, new site for me. Um, lots more positive feedback coming through. I'm just scrolling to see if there's um, any more questions. Uh, Ian has. Uh, Ian's commented, hi Zoe from Havoc Meadows here. Uh, hi, oh, hi Zoe from Havoc Meadows here. Hi. How did, hi, Zoe. Uh, how did our sex pentatus get here from America? Was it via a plant in the botanic gardens? Also a cheeky side question. You mentioned pseudoscorpions. Any tips on finding those in Scotland? Yes. So the thank you for the um, for the spiders. I got them yesterday, and I will be looking at them later after this. Um, and um, yeah. So nobody knows how they got here. Nobody really knows how long they've been here. Um, they could have been here for quite some time without being noticed. Um, and it's not one hundred percent certain where they where they came from. I think America is most likely in terms of um, even prevailing winds, if that was how they got here, I don't know. But um, there are also links between all of the sites they've been found on and a, and a particular place in Russia. So um, it is difficult to know. They might have come a few times. Um, just don't know. It, certainly something I would love to find out. As to pseudoscorpions, um, th so a really easy way to find them. Well, I say easy, but it might take you a lot of tries to actually get one. Um, but something that you can do with things that you probably have at home, or you may have at home, is you take a garden sieve and go to woodland with lots of leaf litter and sift that leaf litter onto a sheet or a tray. And that I've certainly found pseudoscorpions that way many times. Um, bug vac is really good at finding pseudoscorpions. Um, but I, I found pseudoscorpions just by turning over rocks on the tops of Munro's as well. So <laughs> you just never know. Excellent. Um, I think that's all the questions that uh, have come through that I've asked you now, Chris, other than lots of positive feedback. I'll read one or two out. Ro Roslyn said uh, she can't wait to go and look more closely at spiders now with her spider mad three year old, uh, which is which is fantastic. Uh, Chris has some fantastic uh, YouTube videos um, going spider hunting around his house. And uh, if you if you want to have a look for them, Roslyn, excellent for uh, for younger spider searchers. Um, um, I've just, can, can I, thanks for saying that. But um, can I just say, um, Mark Mark Rollins has just said he's found pseudoscorpions using a Burley's funnel, um, and yeah, that's another thing that you can do. Um, I've used various funnel setups um, where you take um, some material from outdoors, like leaf litter or whatever, um, and put it in a funnel with a, a, a heated light above and something underneath, um, and the invertebrates in that material go th down into whatever collection thing you've got. Uh, questions has come through from Patrick. Separating the Dystera species, have have you got uh, have you got to look at their legs? Yeah, you have to look at spines on their legs. Grand. 
Um, OK, so I think that's all the questions, Chris. I, I echo the, the comments that are coming through. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Uh, very well delivered. We, um, we've got through a lot of questions, and so there's obviously been a lot of interest and engagement with, uh, with the presentation. Patrick's just come back and said, um, any tips on, on doing it? Presumably the, the, the legs, looking uh, at the legs. If, if you go on to, I'd say the thing, if you can find Caledonian Conservation on Twitter, um, there are posts on there with photos um, that show the spines and things. Um, so you can, it's something you can do from photos if you've got them in focus. So I'd suggest having a look there. Great. OK. So yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Um, very much appreciated your time this morning and expertise. And thank you very much to everybody for attending and making it such an informative and engaging event this morning. Cool. Actually, something's just popped into my head on on the relating to the Destera question. The British Arachnological Society publish um, things on how to separate difficult species, um, and they're available on their website. And I'm pretty sure they've got one for the Destera there as well. So it might be worth checking that out. And sorry, yeah, thanks, Craig. It's been great. Thanks for everyone coming. I'm real I'm amazed at how many people have come. I'm it's really made my day. Um, yeah.